Today, I'm joined by Melissa Arcand, who is an associate professor at the College of Agriculture and Bioresources at the University of Saskatchewan. Melissa, could you just start off by telling me a bit about your areas of research? So I'm a, a soil scientist and um, you know, I did my PhD uh, in soil science at the University of Saskatchewan, looking at um, nutrient cycling in pulse crop systems. Uh, but since I was hired at the University of Saskatchewan as a faculty member, um, part of my job was also to teach and to advise in the Kanawe Ketan Aski program, which is a certificate program designed to train uh, students working in Indigenous communities around land and resource management. And nearly every year, um, my students uh, are 100% uh, Indigenous, or the cohort of students are comprised of, of Indigenous um, Indigenous students. And uh, through that experience in, in teaching those students, um, and they come from all across Canada, inevitably, um, every single student that may have come from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, or Alberta, uh, within their their role and their their jobs um, in their home communities working in land management uh, they always have the experience of um, of working uh, to manage lands that are agricultural lands um, and I myself um, come from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory and I grew up um, on a grain farm my my parents farmed for 37 years on the reserve so um, farmed solely land that was on the reserve. And so um, through both personal experience and in working with uh, students who work for their First Nation after they graduate, uh, it, it came to be quite clear that there was large gaps in uh, our knowledge base in terms of current um, present day soil management um, and, and agricultural management and how that relates to ensuring that uh, land that is being farmed on the reserve, which is primarily being done by non-Indigenous neighboring farmers, um, wanting to ensure that um, those, those lands are, are being sustainably managed um, you know, for, for long-term uh, sustainability. And, and not only just for the economic gain um, that, that might be <clears throat> disproportionately um, reaped by the, by the farmer and not the nation. Yeah, and, and you briefly touched on it before, but there are a variety of systemic barriers that Indigenous farmers are faced with. Um, I know the issue is very multifaceted, but maybe what are some of the larger issues that Indigenous farmers are facing? Probably the biggest barrier stems out of um, any policy that comes out of the Indian Act. Um, and so, for example, probably the most common um, practical barrier that First Nations face is that uh, because we don't own our land, um, we, it can't be used, uh, you know, to, to um, go and get a loan. So that's a, a real barrier that uh, not people who own their own land. So, you know, even an indigenous person who owns their own land, like I own my own house, you know, I, I have capital um, and I can use, you know, use that to, to um, you know, to build up my, my own credit and to be able to go out and, and gain, you know, get another loan. Um, and that's not the case for First Nations people who might have, um, who definitely have access to land and that land might be, you know, incredibly high quality, good land. But if you can't, you know, if you can't, if you're needing to buy farm equipment and inputs and all of the really capital intensive, um, you know, infrastructure that you need to farm, and you can't go out and get a loan, well, you're kind of, um, you know, <laughs> that's a major barrier. So that's probably the, the biggest barrier is just that inability to access the, um, you know, capital needed to, to farm. Absolutely. And, and for non-Indigenous farmers, what are some lessons that they could maybe learn from uh, practices within Indigenous agriculture? I think if, uh, you know, neighboring, not only just neighboring farmers, but neighboring non-Indigenous people um, could really benefit from understanding why, um, you know, First Nations people, you know, don't, don't participate in agriculture to the same degree that everybody else does. And I think if they can understand that there was some, you know, real institutional policy barriers that, 
that caused that to happen, it would probably help to understand, um, you know, the desire and the, and the and in some cases need to kind of re revitalize that. Um, but I think there's also a lot to be learned about um, just the way that Indigenous people view the land and and our relationship to the land that it's it's a reciprocal as reciprocal relationship and and one in which there's you know a, not just a material connection but also you know a real cultural spiritual connection to the land and i think even just having an understanding of that relationship you know it could go a long way in also understanding um why there's such a, a strong desire and, and connection to wanting to um, protect the lands, you know, steward the land over <clears throat> with the with the long term um, goals in mind, you know, for protecting that land for future generations. For sure. Melissa, thank you so much for for taking the time to talk with me about this today. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much.